Hi, it's Michelle here from Lion Art Studio. Uh, today I've got a little froggy little sketch for you. And we'll go from the start to the finish. So I begin with a blank canvas and my pencil out of my Procreate um, portrait set. And I always work on a coloured canvas. So the bottom layer or the canvas layer I'll always change to a colour or a value. So to start off sending, I'm doing this in grayscale to begin. It's a, um, a few values up from white. So you're not working on a plain white canvas. It's better for your eyes. And it's also better to be able to judge all the values against each other. So I'm starting off this is a really rough base sketch. Just trying to get some shapes down and get the idea down. For this you work as fast and loose as you can. Don't, don't be worried about your lines not being perfect or anything. It doesn't matter. It's more important to get the gesture. Now I've knocked back the opacity, put another layer on top of it, and now I'm refining the sketch a little bit more. It's just looking at your subject and looking at the angles, the shapes, the basic shapes that are in there in relation to one another. So you can see his leg sticks out there and comes back in on the flower petal. There it comes back in onto the other leg, comes out and then back in onto the top of the stem. little fingers, froggy fingers are above the eye. And it's not perfect, it's not a perfect copy, which is not what I'm after. I'm just after the, the basic the basic look and the basic feel of it. Which is what I go for whenever I'm drawing anything. Unless it's a portrait for like a fine art type of portrait that I'm doing of a family or a single subject and the likeness has to be perfect, yes, I'll put a lot more um, effort into measuring and making sure that all my, all my shapes, all my lines and everything's measured perfectly because if you're out too much, it can really change the likeness of a person. But when you're doing something like this, it's not it doesn't have to be perfect. It just you just want it to have the essence of the image. Not getting too caught up in all the details or anything, just getting the base shapes and things down and a few markers and now I'm using the transform tool because I felt his head was not quite right it was on a looking down a little bit too much it should have been higher sorry looking upwards more that's what I meant I love these tools, they're so cool. Can't do that in a sketchbook. <laughs> the beauty of digital. Just removing a few 
lines that I don't think are quite right. As I said, it doesn't need to be perfect, but I want to get it as close to right as possible. Just to make sure it feels realistic. I tell you, I really admire people who do caricatures. It's, yeah, they're so cool. I've never really put my mind to doing something like that, but one day I'd like to. It's my, my work's really more realistic based than anything else but yeah when it's done really well caricatures they're just amazing very very smart artists they know where to push and pull and change anatomy in the right places and that yeah very very cool still just looking at the shapes and the um, different objects the flower petal thing out the back there. I'm not really quite sure what it is, but I added it anyway. I'm not sure whether it's a... It just doesn't look like another petal, and it doesn't look like it's part of the frog either, but it's there. Using the transform tool again, and the walk tool. Just to get the petals a bit... to feel a bit... But bit more like the subject. I'm sorry I've still got a really bad chest infection and my voice is very husky and I know my Australian accent isn't easy for some people to understand. I'm sorry about that. There's not a lot to say while, <laughs> while the sketch is being done, but I'm trying to do these slower videos, especially for beginners, so that you can see what's going on and you're not getting lost in the lost in the process when it's going too quickly. And see, I just changed the reference picture into grayscale, and that's so that we can do this in grayscale because I really think it benefits beginners to work in values first. There's a lot to learn when you're learning and there's a lot to figure out. You've got to figure out the actual how to draw the subject, how to sketch it out. You've got to work out all the values to be able to um, show light and shadow and actually adding lighting, all of that. It's, it's a lot and adding colour theory on top of that is, yeah, just complicates things. So it's a really, really easy way to learn is starting with doing values. All those little squiggles in the background, I've now blurred out just to make sure that there's some foliage and something in the background. And now start eyeing the values. Now th this looks really dark and you could say it's black but it's not. I never use pure black or pure white when I'm doing a value sketch, a value base. And the white looks really white but it's not. It's still grey. It's still a few, few values above white. And the reason I do that is because black and white won't colour so when you go to change it to colour they won't hold any colour because black and white aren't colours so keep it to the mid mid range mid values whenever you're doing something like this and you'll find that it'll colour a lot better oh new subscriber to my channel hello there Jose and thank you
starting to do the little froggy. <coughs> oh, excuse me, sorry. So these, what I've added now are just base values, a flat value for each element. This gives me the shape, the base of the shape, and then I'll add clipping mask on top of each element. And what a clipping mask does, it keeps whatever you're painting inside the lines or inside the shape that you have below. Whatever you painted below, the clipping mask is attached to. It won't go outside of that area, which is really really good because it helps you speed up your process you're not worrying about being very neat going around contours and keeping inside lines and this industry is all about speed especially once you start working in it you've got to be able to be quick you've got to really be able to knock things out and get them to your clients and then you'll have changes and you've got to be able to do the changes quickly and yeah and if you take too long, you're not going to make as much money. And sadly, we need money to live. And for some reason, people think that art, well, not all people, but a lot of people think that artists don't deserve to be paid what their value is truly worth. I see so many people out there doing portraits and things like that really cheap and yeah that's that's a bit sad really cheapens the industry a lot now I'm looking at the values Even though I'm copying a reference, I still think about where the light and shadow, uh, I mean, the light's coming from and where it's going to cast shadows. And that's what you really need to think about. Not just looking at the image and copying it. Really think about how the light's affecting it, where the light is coming from. So that when you do start to draw things from your imagination, or draw something that you want to add a different lighting scenario to or anything like that. You can't just look at it and copy. You need to be able to know exactly how light works. So you've got your light comes from the um, top left in this top left front actually in this image. So look at things like the top of his head where it's getting a lot of light, the top petals on the left hand side of the flower getting a lot of light and then underneath his chest that's casting a shadow, it's casting a shadow onto the um, stem of the flower and then there's a form shadow underneath his chest as it turns away from the light, as the form turns away from the light. All these little subtleties are really, really important. The same with these on the top of his eyes. You look at his eyes behind them and they've got that little shadow. That's a form shadow because it's the form as it turns away from the light. So any shadow that is on the actual object where it's that plane of the object is turning away from the light is called a form shadow and a cast shadow is when one object casts a shadow onto another object and that can be a, like a face it can be the nose can cast a shadow onto the cheek it's not necessarily a separate object altogether but when you break it down into the simplest objects it's the different objects of the face or the hand or whatever casting onto the other part of the face 
I hope I'm explaining this okay. I'm sorry, I'm not the best teacher in the world. Let me know. Let me know if you don't understand a word I'm saying. It's really valuable for me to know this. Because I don't do these just for the fun of it. They are fun, but I'm doing it so that I can share what I've been lucky enough to learn through art school and through artists that I've admired over the years and done classes with. I'm looking at his little belly, which is hidden away from the light a bit more. And under his mouth and and then you look at his throat and there's bounce light coming back. The bounce light is when it's hitting, hitting an object and then the light bounces back up and hits another object. So say you've got a, um, a vase on a table and at the bottom of that vase there'll be the shadow and then light will hit the table outside that shadow area and it will the rays bounce back up onto the vase and you'll see a an area of light that's a bit lighter at the base and that's called bounce light because light rays bounce around all over the place Still looking at the values and trying to get them close to right. Now I'm just collapsing the layers, the clip, clipping mask onto the below, the layer below. I like to keep layers as simple as possible. Sometimes it's not possible to do that, but whenever I can merge layers, I'll do that. A little bit of light that's getting onto the stem, top of the stem there. And the majority of all this painting at the, you know, this stage of the painting, I pretty much use my big blocking brush. It's my favourite brush. It's a big square brush that's just beautiful to use. I love it. If I'm doing some smaller details, I'll sometimes use the thick and thin pen. Adding the light to Froggy. Freddo, maybe. Freddo Froggy. That's a bit mean though. Get eaten because he's Freddo. I think frogs are really cool actually. They're such interesting little creatures. And they kind of got that smile all the time happening with that big froggy mouth. And 
<laughs> it's a pretty spectacular reference photo actually. It's off um, Pixabay, I think. Which brings me to references. When you use references, it's fine to grab whatever image you can find when you're doing a study and things like that. But if you plan on selling your paintings, it's a really good idea to use references that you've even taken yourself. You get off um, a place like Pixabay or on Splash, which a Creative Commons license, which allows you to use the images. Um, Or you can buy, you can purchase reference packs and stock photos. They're not that expensive and you build up a really good library of them. Um, some good ones on Cube Brush, Gumtree, uh, Gumroad, Gumroad, I think it is. Um, yeah, you know, there's, there's different places you can get them, but um, it's, it's not right to just grab an image, copy it, and then sell it. It's, yeah, it's not right. It's the photographer that's taken the photo has put a lot of time and effort into getting the, the photo done and, you know, they've traipsed around in the bush to get this photo of this, this frog perfectly sitting on this little flower like this. Paid a lot of money for specialist camera equipment with macro lenses and, you know, and the time and the effort and the money invested learning to be a photographer and all of that. They deserve to be paid just as much as we do and not have their work taken and copied. And if you do find a photo that you really, really love and you really, really want to do, you can always message her photographer or the owner of the photo and ask them a lot of them will say yeah no worries you can use it others will say well yeah okay you can use it but please don't sell it or, or others will say no you can't use it that's the end of it which is fair enough too or you can offer to buy it from them which I've done before I've purchased photos from photographers that I've um come across that have had a really great set that I really liked. We're all creatives and it's really important to support each other and help each other out where we can. So these last two videos I've been using the references literally. I'm going to do a few more showing you how to use references as more as a guide. So um, you create a mood board with various photos. You might like hands out of something or you might like an expression on someone's face, hair on someone else, um, the lighting in another, another scenario. And you take a little bit from each one and it's, yeah, that's the real way to use references that is um, when you're really creating an image, an illustration, not just doing a study like this. Now it's not a race. Take your time. Keep adjusting to make sure that your um, shapes are right and look good in relation to one another. I've turned off the sketch layer now just to make sure that all my shapes are coming together nicely, adding some values to separate the, leaf, the leaves, the um, petals a little bit more.
And there's also artistic license where we can look at an image and say, well, I don't quite like that. I'm not sure about that. That value doesn't really work there. It doesn't separate the element. I need to go a little bit darker here. But have a good understanding of what you're actually doing. Know why you're darkening that value and if it makes sense in the lighting that you've created. That's no good putting If I had made that petal black underneath there, it would have been, yeah, completely wrong. But that touch darker value, it just separated it from the petal next to it. So I'm just adjusting, adding some more shape to the little middle bit of the flower. I don't know what it's called. Stamen or something like that, I think. Correct me. I, I'm not a flower expert by any stretch of the imagination. I know this is a bit boring, I don't know. It, would it be better to speed up through areas of the tutorial when it's something that's taking a little while that I can't add any extra value to when I'm talking? Or are you happy to sit and watch it? Are you happy to watch every little bit? It's That it makes the videos longer, but... Yeah, if, if you get value out of it, I'm completely happy to keep it in. Do you like these videos? Do you what do you think about them? Do you think that doing some different subject matter is a bit of fun? Does it help educationally wise? Or do you just want to see portraits? I think people get a um, mental block with portraits that they're harder than anything else to draw. And yeah, yeah, they are hard. But I don't think they're any harder than anything else. I don't think drawing a portrait of a person is any harder than doing this little froggy. It's all about breaking it down and following some fundamental guidelines. Um, but I, I totally get it. I totally understand why people think that portraits are difficult because I avoided them like the plague. When I first started digital, um, I went to art school for a long time and um, a long time ago. And we did life drawing classes. We had live models come in every day. And I was really young when I was there. I was the youngest at the um, modern school of art. And I found it really embarrassing drawing these new models. I think because I was younger than everyone else, I was only 15 and yeah, I just had a really hard time of it and <laughs> it sort of set me up for throughout my life that I never wanted to draw people, uh, which is really stupid, but it was just a thing I had in my head and I'd draw animals, I'd draw environment, I'd draw anything else so long as it wasn't a person. But then a couple of years ago I decided I would wanted to go freelance as an illustrator and I really had to have a good look at myself and where my where I was going wrong and 
it was literally I had to learn to do portraits. I had to face up to it and I had to just do it. And I'm so glad I did because now portraits are my absolute favourite thing. I love them. I love painting people and the bulk of my work is portrait in portrait form. So there you go. But I was really scared of doing it and I thought it was so hard and but when I got into it I realised that it's no harder than anything else. And when I did go to art school and I studied fine art and graphic design. But back then there weren't the jobs like there are now for illustrators and gaming and um, cinema and everything. It was really, really hard to make a living off your art back then. So I ended up um, going into graphic design when I graduated, which was great and it served the purpose. It fed my family and it was a good job and I enjoyed it to a point but it wasn't creative enough but unfortunately I was stuck in that constant right of where you need to make wages and you needed to you know have the money I also trained racehorses so I didn't have a lot of time to draw and paint back then and then my circumstances changed and I became really sick and had to stop work. And I just started, yeah, started to pick up drawing again, got my sketchbook out and while recovering in hospital after some operations and someone happened to introduce me to some digital painting. And that was it, blew my mind. Although I'd been using project uh, <coughs> programs such as um, Illustrator, Photoshop, Corel Draw for graphic design. It never occurred to me that you could draw and paint in these programs. Not the type of drawing and painting that I do anyway. I mean, I draw logos and things like that, but um, yeah, just never occurred to me. I never thought about it and it totally blew my mind. And the first program that I really learnt to paint in was Corel Painter and oh, it is just the most awesome program. There's nothing like it on the market. Others are trying, you know, they try to come close but it really is like having a virtual toolbox at your fingertips. It's really rich oils and runny watercolours and pastels look like pastels and I literally print my work and sometimes my framers are running their hands over it expecting to get dust like pastel or chalk dust on their fingers and they look at me and say why isn't it coming off and I'm like well it's digital and yeah to me that just amazes me you know it's it's pretty awesome so I am in love with painter and I always will be and I'm also a Corel Painter Master recently, which is pretty cool. I've looked at all these Painter Masters for years and really admired them and to now be one of them is very humbling. But I have worked very hard and it's a testament to the fact that hard work does pay off. And of course, I've still got that niggling voice in my ear saying, you're not good enough. <laughs> but I can't let that worry me. I obviously am good enough. They chose me to be this. And if I wasn't good enough, I wouldn't have been selected. So, yeah, it's a little bit about me. I don't talk about me very much. It's a pretty boring subject. Still making these alterations. They're very cool transform tools in 
procreate. Not taking anything away from procreate, by the way. It is a kick-ass program. Especially for some, you know, a little iPad app. It really is. It's an amazing little program. I love sketching in it. It's totally taken over from my sketchbook. And, and it's convenient and it's easy to do tutorials with. Especially as it records everything. Although I'm recording this through the iPad itself rather than the Procreate recording but um yeah it's just very very simple when you compare to being on a pc and you've got to have a separate recording program for painter or photoshop and then half the time i walk away and i have to edit out like an hour where i've walked away from the computer and then come back and forgotten to stop the recording and yeah it becomes very time consuming Whereas this, yeah, it's very simple. You pretty much record and add a voiceover or add a few captions or whatever you want to add to it and it's ready to go. Well, right, I'm doing a lot of fiddling around here, but I just, yeah. I like to make sure things are right. Savage really listen, don't they? They um, it's come a long way really quickly. Procreate. I like to have everything um, as right as I can while I'm still in grayscale, if I'm doing a grayscale painting first. I just want things to be right before I go to colour. I love the colour picker in um, Procreate. It's really easy. The gestures are very easy to use. And it is a very, very simple program. Just fixing up these little froggy fingers. They're funny little things. They've got little round pads on the end of their little finger things. I don't know what you call frog fingers, but... I'm just using the thick and thin pen here. Making sure that all the little... Little details are quite accurate. If I turn, I don't think I turn the sketch back on and again, but um, it's moved away from the sketch quite a bit now. <laughs> They're funny, little bulgy eyes. Have you ever seen a frog when they catch flies or insects? 
I've got the longest bloody tongue, so unreal. Come flying out and snap that little insect and yeah, they're very cool. They're noisy though. My daughter's place is on a few acres and they get frogs and I used to get frogs on my farm and when you get a lot of them at night time during summer they make quite the racket. Between frogs and cicadas in summer, I don't know which one you want to kill first. If you're trying to sleep. Not that I would ever kill them. I'm not like that, but sometimes you just like them to shut up. This is getting really boring watching myself draw, I tell you. Is it boring for you? Because it's boring for me. If it's boring, let me know. Paying attention still to the values and the um, where the light's hitting, and where the shadows are being cast, where the light turns away from. Sorry, the form turns away from the light. As it does here on the little news. behind the eyes. I waste a lot of time on this just repainting things and fiddling around with things. But in the end we're probably no better than they were about half an hour ago, to be quite honest. I can get hung up in details at times. So remember that eyes also have a shape, like eyes are round, like every animal has round eyes, the eyeball itself is round, so it captures light and it also creates shadow underneath and on the side where it turns away from the light. So don't forget that on human, on any animal there will always be shadows on the eyeballs themselves from the eyelids or from the eyes it turns away beneath every element captures light and creates shadow I don't think I've ever drawn a frog before, to be quite honest. I 
I used to draw a lot of dogs, horses, big cats, horses especially when I was young. I had work published when I was about 10, 11 years old in magazines and my horse pictures. I was pretty good back then. Um, I lost lost a lot of my skills, not using them for many years while working as a graphic designer and dealing with family and all of that sort of thing growing up and you you really need to relearn a lot when you haven't used it, you know, for so long. So And I'm all for education. I think everyone should do some sort of classes, whatever you're, um, you can afford. And I don't mean doing an, a degree in art. I don't think you necessarily need that, but you do need some form of education, whether you do it from learning off YouTube tutorials or classes online or local classes at your community centre. If you're really serious about your art and you want to do something with it, more than just do it for your own enjoyment, um, you, you have to know what you're doing because it is very competitive now. There is more of a market with gaming and um, cinema and book publishing and things like that. There's a lot, a lot more prospects for artists out there, which is the coolest thing, it really is. I really wish that I had have been born a bit later. I would have loved to have done that, worked in a um, studio, gaming studio. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> Pardon me. A um, gaming studio or in cinema, especially. Not that it's too late. It's not. Never too late. But it's very competitive and there's so many good young artists out there. The calibre of artists is amazing actually. And the calibre of digital artists, sorry. God, there's some absolutely incredible artists out there that are mind-blowingly amazing. friends that I've learned of and yeah and artists are such general giving people you know so many give their time to help others learn and they don't make a cent out of it and it does take a lot of time You can keep your layers separated, each element separated, and then create a group, like I just did then. If you wanted to transform it as a whole, you just create the group, select that group, and use the transform tool just as you do on layers, which is really great. Because there are times when you want to do that. I really want to fill the frame with the little frog because he is, he's the, the focus of the piece, the hero of the, 
illustration. And off we go into colour. Yes, love colour. When I work like this, I'll always use a colour layer with a clipping mask on top of each element. Colour layers don't affect the values, so you can get some colour down quickly. And then start painting over the top and adding your extra, extra details, extra hues. But the initial, initial layer when I'm going to colour, I will always use colour. Otherwise it's pointless, really. You might as well not do all the work making all the, um, the um, grayscale painting underneath. Because if you add other color mo uh, other layer modes over the top like multiply and um, even overlay they do change the values so which is fine as you move on to do that because there are you know when you're adding more light and shadow and things multiply and overlay and that are terrific but just to get the colors down on top of your values and keep those values always colour, always colour layer. I change the froggy back into colour, the reference photo. And when I start to get into colour, I like to unclip the um, colour wheel and keep it open there because you're using it a lot. You've got to change the colours and the value, uh, not the values, the colours, the hues a lot when you're starting to colour. And what I'll do is I'll pick a, a base colour for each object and then I'll add to it. So a little froggy's easy, he's got that nice bit of green and yellow happening and a bit of blue. So I'll start with that. Colour really changes. Um, I'm, I'm a fan of black and grey. I really like grayscale images. And some things I, I'll colour them and I keep going back to the grayscale because I really don't like them when they're coloured. But this little froggy's cute in colour. It's a really nice bright image which deserves lots of nice pops of colour. And I'll still use a um, hard round brush or a hard, my square, square um, blocking brush when I'm going with colour. Now I just use the curves to brighten up the colour and because it was a bit dull on top of the values. Just fiddling around to find best outcome. And 
now I'm going through each layer and sharpening it. I love sharpen. Really tightens it all up. Going with multiply now. Starting to add some shadows in. Always looking, always watching my shapes and things if there's anything that needs to be altered. Using some darker red values here just to um, add a little bit more interest, but then I'll knock down the opacity of the layer so it's not too dark. Now I'm in colour. I can use some whites and some blacks. We need sparingly. This still isn't pure white. So I've turned the layer on and off just to check, see if it looks better. Adjusting the um, it felt a bit oversaturated green that needed a bit more yellow in it on that stem. shadows thinking about the form of the object And you will zoom in, I'll zoom in and out all the time because I zoom out to make sure that the values are reading correctly and it's looking right overall. I'll zoom in and do some details like here, I'm doing a bit of blending. This is a round brush but it's got a bit of texture in it. I'm not, um, it's not a soft, soft brush but it's a bit of a textured, harder brush. That I'm using to blend with so it doesn't get too too much of that airbrush blended out look. I prefer my brush strokes to show a bit. Um, I want it to look like a painting more so than a photo. But some areas do need to be blended a little bit. Keep defining those shapes so I don't lose them. Now I've got a lot of colour down there. You'll see me colour picking from it. 
This ensures to keep a um, cohesiveness through the whole image. Clipping mouse I've just added on top. some more details to the stem Using this screen lower mode, lower mode to um, add a little bit more light. And then I'll knock it back with a soft round brush so it's not overbearing. Tweak the opacity of the layer. And although I don't know exactly what's going on inside that flower, I'm just using my observation. You can see a bit of red in there, so it's obviously something in there. Um, any layers that need to be merged. And details to each area. See that line through the um, petals where I've used a lasso tool to um, alter the shape and it's created that little break. I'll fix that up in a minute. very easy just to paint back over it. I just felt like the um, stems a little, a little bit flat. And it just needed some more shadows to help that form. Now 
and say you see a multiply layer but I'm using a really light bright yellow there for the shadows you don't want your um, shadows to be too too desaturated and dark because it creates a muddiness muddy colors so try to keep your um, colors saturated your shadow saturated especially that little little spot there in under his throat I hadn't painted but thought I had which I didn't notice until we went to colour so I've just fixed that bit of light to the little bits on the stem whatever they're called so I say no flower expert at all those little bits under the, the flower I thought they were the wrong they were too purple so I just added some green to it and the reason for that is it's probably the light from the environment that's um, bouncing back on or reflecting off the bits in the flower they probably are a deeper purple but because there's a lot of green and yellow around in the environment the lights reflecting onto onto them now I'm going to fix up that little crack Is darker values just add a little bit more um, interest and form keep, keep it from getting too flat as I mentioned before you know you need to take a little bit of an artistic license and um, if you feel you need to change something go for it No, 
little bit reflected light off the top of the flower petals. It's a very bright day. What's your favourite subject to paint? What do you like to paint more than anything else? I'd like to hear. Is there anything you'd like me to paint? Any sort of subject that you'd like to see? Just adding a little bit of shadow. I've used a blue on a multiply layer. And then knock it right, right back. And then use the eraser just to um, Bring it back a little bit in certain spots. Keeping in mind where my light's coming from. A bit more light to froggy face and his little arm. And then legs and mouth. And hand. <laughs> sure to keep add the different colour hues because he's got a lot of um, colour on him he's a pretty little froggy Animals have such beautiful, well, lots of animals have such beautiful colours in their skin and their coats. Our skin's so boring, even though it's made up of a lot of colour. Most of that colour is because of the tissue that's beneath it and the um, reflected light from around the environment and things interacting with us. Our skin. Well, our skin's pretty basic, really. No beautiful colour patterns going on. I think that's why tattoos are so popular. I'm exaggerating shadows still.
little shadows to his eyes. I wasn't happy with the pupils, so redrawing them again. So different to ours, the little dragony sort of shape of eye, a pupil. It's interesting, isn't it? I wonder what they can see whether they see all the colours that we see and shapes in the same way or whether they view the world completely differently. Adding some more detail with my thick and thin brush. And little creases under his arm where the skin folds. round texture brush that I've been using for the blending is in my portrait set too. Pretty much all the brushes are. The only time I use another brush is for um, uh, a bit of texture where the little dots are on his chest. Just try and just find a nice little brush that would create that. But I didn't want it to look too much like a pattern. So I just kept a little bit of that of that texture. Trying different things, they didn't quite work different brushes but they just weren't weren't what I was looking for
I've got so many brushes that I never use. Like I always stick to the same two or three brushes. Unless there's something a little bit different that I need to add to it. So I forget what brushes I've got that I can use for that sort of thing. And it's trial and error, so it's a good thing if you um, make yourself sets of brushes with your favourite brushes. It just makes it easier to find them. So you're not mucking around like I am here. sort of left a nice bit of texture I liked so I do leave some of it I erase a bit away with the soft ground brush but um, I do leave a little bit of it there that texture it's like a diamondy ochre pattern and on his head just needed a little bit of texture there Still looking for some brushes that will um, do exactly what I want there. Which, yeah, again, I had left a little bit of this um, newsprint texture, which is a a standard brush in the Procreate packs. In the end, I just went to the hard brush ground and altered it a bit, altered the spacing and the jitter just to um, create the dots that I wanted and the size dynamics so I'd get some small, some big. And that gave me really the little dots that I wanted. I could have done all this by hand by now, I know, but it was a good exercise trying some different brushes out anyway. Add layer mode, which is one of my favourite. I love the light that it brings in. It's absolutely stunning. Go very gently. It can be very overpowering. These little froggy spots. I'm 
just changing the um, hydro and brush back to its normal state. We're getting there, not too far away from finishing, I don't think. Just making sure I keep those folds and the skin and any other elements of um, the other little details that are important to keeping it real. That little bit of shadow I added there is just to um, show that it's not a part of the eye. It gives it a little bit, it hasn't got a shadow there in the reference, but it just it was blending into the eye too much. I wanted to make sure that it was separated a bit. Little wee nostrils. bit of light over the top of them. And his nosy bit. Just making sure everything's right and I'm happy with it. Just 
squeaking anything, dropping it all. And it's finished. Just got to sign it. My signature I keep separate so I can just bring it in and um, place it. Makes it easy. And there he goes. Bye bye, Mr. Froggy. Hope you enjoyed this. Thank you.